Okay, so that's, that's basically just the introduction to the model, and we'll use that again throughout the, the, the lecture series. So that, that model for the surface temperature of the Earth is important. Okay. Um, so the rest of the lecture, we're going to go on and talk just a little bit about um, how the climate system works. Okay, so we've got this really simple kind of uh, uh, equation that describes the surface temperature, but the climate is much more than just the temperature of the Earth. So there are all these kind of like terms we need to think about. Um, so first of all, climate forcing. Okay, so a climate forcing is basically the, a primary uh, driver of that equation. Okay, so it's something that causes something that you change that is not related to the, the climate system directly. So, for instance, changing the power of the sun, okay, so that the sun doesn't care if there are planets outside of it. Okay, so it's completely independent of, of the climate itself. If we change the power of the sun, we will change the climate. Okay, so that's a climate forcing. Similarly, if we, uh, if we add lots of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, okay, that could be considered as a climate forcing if the addition of that greenhouse ga those greenhouse gases were not a response of climate change. So, for example, if we burnt lots of fossil fuels, you know, who would do such a stupid thing? Um, if we burn lots of fossil fuels, that would be considered a climate forcing because we're adding something that's not from the climate to the, um, to the atmosphere, and that's changing one of those parameters in the equation. Okay? But uh, you can think if the, if, the, if the climate is changing anyway, and maybe uh, it gets lots, much, much wetter, and we start to get much more wetlands, okay? those wetlands will produce lots of methane, Methane is a greenhouse gas. So it'll have the same effect. It'll change one of the parameters in the equations. But it's not a forcing, okay, because it's a response to a climate change. Okay? So it's quite subtle about uh, what is a climate forcing. And at the bottom here, what is a climate feedback? And we'll come on to this in, in other lectures as well. But that second example of a, an environmental change causing some gas emission or so some change in albedo, that would then be considered a feedback. Okay, so the distinction between a climate forcing and a climate feedback in some cases is a little bit blurred, but in some cases it's very, very clear cut. Okay? So uh, those are forcings and feedbacks. So the response, what happens to the climate, is a sense of the climate response. Okay? Um, and we can quantify the climate response in the terms of uh, climate sensitivity. So for any given amount of change, how many degrees Kelvin does the, does the climate change by? Okay. Um, uh, sometimes this climate sensitivity is given in, in terms of, uh, when you're looking at climate models, you might say, if we doubled the atmospheric CO2 concentration, what would be the sensitivity of the climate to that change? Okay, in terms of how many degrees Kelvin will it get warmer? Um, and then there's this other term which is kind of related to the climate sensitivity is the response time. So in our simple model, if we made the atmosphere twice as uh, um, absorptive, okay? it would, in our model, it would change the temperature instantly. Okay? But because the climate system doesn't respond instantly, because it has thermal mass, it takes a long time for the temperature to kind of equilibrate, and also because there are these climate feedbacks, which we'll go on to in other lectures, these, some of these feedbacks take time. So for instance, if the climate got wetter, okay, we won't immediately get more wetlands. Okay? Those wetlands will take many, many years to develop, and over those years, they'll start to give off more methane gases. Okay? So in, in that case, the climate response time can be quite long. Okay? And, some, and some things in the climate system are really, really rapid. They happen you know, overnight. And other things in the climate system do take millions of years to reach an equilibrium. So kind of, it's one of these really cool things about kind of the planet is it, it responds on a whole bunch of different timescales. So. Okay, so this should be, should be moving in a kind of really jerky 90s GIF kind of way. Um, so the question at the top, what is climate? So our model okay, has, has just defined climate or describes climate in terms of the average temperature of the Earth. Okay? But actually, when we think about climate, we don't want to just define the average temperature of the Earth. We want to define a whole other bunch of things about that temperature. So what is the distribution of the temperature? Are some parts of the Earth colder and some parts hotter? Okay, so we could describe, for instance, 
the gradient of temperature or the, the pole to equator temperature difference, that is kind of a descriptor of climate. Okay, so that, that, that gradient would make up part of our description of what the climate is like. Okay, you can see that also the, this, um, this goes through seasons. Okay, so in the winter it's cold, in the summer it's hot. Okay, so that seasonal cycle is that description of that seasonal, seasonal cycle is also part of climate. Okay. So if the difference between summer and winter got less, and summer was more like winter and winter was more like summer, that would be a climate change. Okay? Even though we're not changing the average temperature, changing what we call the seasonality, okay? so the difference between winter and summer, that is part of climate change. And that is one of the really big drivers, well, more important things for kind of like people, because you know, we don't really care what the average temperature is. We care if there's going to be a really hot summer or a really wet winter. Okay? Those are the things that actually make the, the human interaction with climate change okay, expensive. Okay? So climate is not just the average temperature. I think that's the kind of take-home message from that slide. Um, okay, so the next uh, kind of few slides, we're just going to go through some of the, the, the mechanisms of just descriptively how the kind of the, the earth works with relation to climate. So this is kind of a, a section through the atmosphere. Okay, so it, rather than, I so said we've got altitude on one side and pressure on the other side. So as you go up in the atmosphere, the pressure goes down until you get into space and there's, you can't, there's almost no atmosphere at all. Um, and then on the, the, the x-axis here, we've got temperature. Okay, so we've got our surface temperature here at about kind of 15 degrees Celsius, kind of, which is kind of what our model kind of predicted, which is kind of nice. Um, and then as you go up in the atmosphere, it gets colder. Okay? Um, and then until you get up into the stratosphere, where um, it starts to get warmer. Okay? And if you think about what that means, so you, you should kind of know that if something gets hot, it expands and becomes less dense. Yeah? So the atmosphere here is hot, and the atmosphere up here is cold. Okay, so that means that you've got something that's cold and dense <laughs> above something that's warm and kind of less dense. Okay? That is abhorrence to nature. Okay? It will want to flip the other way out. Okay? And that does happen because you should know that basically the, 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 the atmosphere is very, very well mixed. So it's constantly churning around. And that's because it's basically being heated from the bottom. Okay? So we're adding heat at the bottom. The atmosphere because the atmosphere is heated from the earth it's not heated from the sun the, the we do have some heating at the top of the atmosphere up in the stratopause here and that's basically ozone absorbing the shortwave radiation okay so we do and that's why the stratosphere is so uh, stable that's why it's called the stratosphere because it's stratified in lots of layers and we have warm air on top of cold air and that basically keeps it nice and um, stratified but the bottom of the atmosphere is really, really turbulently mixed, and that's what basically gives us lots and lots of weather, okay, what makes our atmosphere very unpredictable. Um, atmosphere, I, I really don't expect me to, to read all of these things, but just to point out that the atmosphere is made up of a whole bunch of gases and water vapour, uh, uh, and it's mostly um, water vapour, nitrogen, oxygen, okay, but there are all these trace, so these are present, these Carbon dioxide, neon, helium, methane, ammonia, nitrous oxide, um, sulfur dioxide, things like that. They're all present in the atmosphere, but they're at super, super low concentrations. So their total masses down here, many orders of magnitude less than the major gases. But these are really important climatically because some of these are the ones that do this absorb absorbing of the long wave radiation, particularly carbon dioxide ammonia, nitrous oxide, these are really strong greenhouse gases. Okay, so the other thing about the atmosphere, well, I guess the thing about the planet, is that the planet is round. Okay, so we found out it was important for distributing that energy from, that's being intercepted by essentially the, 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 a disk of the Earth, spreading that over the surface area of the Earth, but also it's important because it determines where gets lots of energy and where it gets less energy. So if you have energy coming in at the equator, the equator is kind of perpendicular to the sun, so it receives that same amount of energy over a small area 
Whereas at the poles, okay, that same incoming radiation is spread out over quite a wide area. Okay? And this is basically why when you go to the, the north of Scotland, it's cold. And when you go on the environmental geoscience field trip to Jamaica, it is very hot. Um, those of you who are not going on that field trip, oh well, it's up to be you. Um, so this causes, this, there's this gradient. So this is basically the amount of solar radiation that's absorbed by the surface of the Earth. So this is a combination of that spherical component of the, the poles not getting uh, much energy and the equator getting lots, and also the reflectivity, uh, so the albedo. So, so you can see here that, that some places uh, near the equator, like the Sahara Desert here, okay, it should be getting kind of like more radiation absorbed by the Earth than it is because it's really reflective, okay? Because it's basically a light yellow color, okay? Um, whereas the ocean absorbs more, okay? So this is the amount that's being heated at the Earth's surface, and we can get another amount of the amount that's actually getting out into space. So this is the long wave radiation that's coming out in space, and we can see again here that once again the regions around the equator are giving out more energy than the poles, and that's because they are hotter. Okay, so those are hotter places. Uh, it's slightly more patchy this time. We've got this band of uh, low uh, emission over the equator, and that's because this region of the Earth is really, really cloudy. Okay, so the long wave radiation can't really get through those clouds that are forming at the intertropical convergence zone. So this is basically where we have rainforests, there are lots of rain, uh, and that, that, those clouds stop the radiation getting out. But what you hopefully can see from this figure is that the, the colour contrast is not as big as it was from the one before, between the north and the south. So if we do this one, so this is the net radiation. So this is the, basically the difference between what's coming in at the Earth's surface and what's going out. Okay? We can see that the, um, the equator, okay, that is receiving much more radiation that is giving out, got positive numbers, whereas the poles, they're actually giving out more radiation than they're receiving. Okay? So you've got negative numbers. Okay? So that's odd. So what that, that sets up is that in the, so this is basically a, a, all of that flux of energy just averaged up for every latitude. Um, so this is the equator in the middle, the North Pole, the South Pole. So in the, around the equator, we're getting more energy than we're giving out. So we've got a surplus of energy. And then in the, um, uh, the polar regions, we're giving out more energy than we're getting. So if nothing happened, the poles would get colder and colder and colder and colder and colder. And the equator would get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. Okay? And then we know that's not happening. Okay? Every year... Uh, and the poles don't get colder and colder and colder. Okay. So what is happening is that to basically balance out this mismatch in energy fluxes, okay, the atmosphere moves. Okay, so it transports heat from the, the equator to the polar regions. Okay, and it does that through a series of atmospheric circulations. So warm air gets heated over the equator, rises up, and it moves towards the poles where it kind of heats the Earth near the poles, okay? And then uh, those, these circulations carry on. And these basically transport heat from the tropics up into the, the, the high latitudes, okay? And the details of this are not massively important for this course, but basically the hotter or the bigger this, this gradient between the, the hotness at the equator and the coldness at the poles, the stronger this atmospheric circulation gets. So the bigger that gradient, the more kind of vigorous the atmospheric circulation is. Okay, so it's not just um, uh, because we're because we're on a, a spherical rotating planet that atmospheric transport of, of air towards the poles that actually gets deflected by the Coriolis force stuff you might cover in oceanography or or met weather and climate or stuff like that if you do those courses um, and also the the Earth's planet the Earth's planet the planet of the uh, the Earth uh, is not just uh, a, a uniform sphere. It has continents on it, which kind of deflect some of these flows of air. Okay, so the winds don't just blow north, south, east, west. They go all kinds of over the shop. Okay, and actually the positions of the continents are quite important for determining the exact nature of these flows. Okay, in the ocean, 
similar things happen. So the ocean heats up in the equator, okay? And is, as the ocean moves around, it distributes that heat towards the polar regions. Um, now, the thing about the ocean is that it is very different to the atmosphere in a number of different ways. So not only is it made of water and not a gas, but the atmosphere is kind of continuous all the way around the globe. Whereas the ocean is split up into a bunch of different ocean basins, which are separated from each other by the continents. Okay? They're also much, much rougher at the bottom, okay? because there's no erosion to, to basically plane off these kind of like underwater mountains. Okay? So this is a map of the Atlantic, here's kind of the UK, Ireland, and you can see that the surface is really, really rough. Okay? And that rough surface and kind of constricted nature of the basins determines where the water can flow around. Another thing is that we described earlier how the atmosphere is basically heated from the bottom. Okay? So this is an analogy for the atmosphere. It's heated from the bottom, so that makes it really turbulent and well mixed. Okay? So if you measure the concentration of like some components of the atmosphere in one place, it will be very similar to somewhere else. Okay? So it's, it's very, well, very well mixed. Whereas the ocean is heated from above. Okay? So the atmosphere and the uh, incoming solar radiation is heating the surface of the ocean um, and that means that the top layer of the ocean is, um, is warmer than the bottom of the ocean because that's where the heat's coming in. Okay? That means that that's the low density bit and the bottom is less dense which means that it doesn't, that's very very stable so it doesn't circulate as vigorously as the atmosphere. So this is why if you, if you take uh, a grill and you put a pan of water under the grill, it will never boil. Okay? Don't try this because it's just a waste of energy. Um, but it will never boil because you just form a layer of hot water on top of the cold water underneath, and that just insulates it from the heat. Okay? That just gradually evaporates off until you get down to a tiny little bead of water at the bottom. Okay? So don't try and um, grill water. It's just stupid. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of like a, a section through the ocean, sorry, a, a, a profile, so the surface of the ocean down to maybe five kilometres depth, because the ocean is quite deep. Um, and you get warmer water at the surface, colder water at the bottom, and that creates basically this thing called a thermocline, which is basically just a gradient in temperature, which means you've got low density water that sits on top of the, the cold water underneath. And that leads to a very, very sluggish circulation. Okay? The surface of the ocean still whizzes around quite quickly, and that's blown around by winds. Okay, so the surface circulation of the ocean looks something like this. Okay, and we get that transports water north and south from the equator, but the deep ocean, okay, so the deep ocean circulation is much, much slower. So this is a section for the oceans of Antarctica to, um, I think, uh, Greenland up there. And you can see that the deep ocean basin, there is circulation that goes on down here. And this is important because the ocean is really big, Okay, like really big, uh, and water has a really high heat capacity. So although it's moving slowly, it can transport heat north and south. Okay, but um, it does it in a much more slow and predictable way than the atmosphere. Um, okay, so I think we're kind of coming to the end of the lecture here. Hopefully, because we're getting that time of day. Um, but this is kind of like a, a cartoon of the kind of stuff that we're going to be looking at for the rest of the. Um, the, the lecture series on, on climate. We've got all these kind of things going on, so changes in solar radiation, changes in fluxes of greenhouse gases from maybe volcanoes, changes in weathering, uh, changes in uh, you know, how carbon is partitioned between the atmosphere and the ocean, changes in ice sheets. Okay, so you see the amount more ice you have on the planet, the shinier it will become. Changes in these things. And we're going to look at that equation, which you should all know, and see how those changes will affect the Earth's climate and how they, these changes might be used to explain changes in the past. Okay? Um, yeah. Uh, and then hopefully we'll also look at the, um, in fact we will, look at how some of the interactions between those different things in, the, in that, that cartoon before, how they interact between each other um, to, to drive these changes. So, for example, uh, we might, well, tomorrow we'll look at weathering and see how changes in particularly um, maybe climate might make weathering change, which might then feed back into a climate change, or a change in vegetation, which might feed back into a change in albedo, or a change in uh, emissivity. 
Okay? So we'll look into some of these links between different parts of the climate system. Um, let's not talk about that. Uh, and basically, the rest of the, the lecture series will go through geological time um, from kind of really, really long, million-year time scale changes, okay? so across maybe the whole Phanerozoic, so since the Cambrian to the present. And then we'll be looking progressively shorter time series, okay? looking at maybe um, a few million years of, of change to a few tens of thousands of years change to changes which are on kind of like time scales, like uh, uh, maybe only a few years, to see how these different time scales of response. So some parts of the climate system respond very, very slowly and cause, but can cause quite large changes in climate, whereas other aspects of the climate system can respond really quickly. Okay. And we'll, we'll look basically how those, those different responses are mediated by kind of Earth system processes. So to how the geology interacts with the climate system, which kind of like ultimately combines to make the planet kind of habitable, or at least changing its climate throughout a geological time scales. OK, so <clears throat> to summarize, um, so hopefully we've made this model of the greenhouse effect. OK, we, can, we, we basically understand how the power of the sun, the reflectivity or albedo of the planet, and the emissivity of the atmosphere, so that's essentially how much greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere, how those three parameters combine to determine the average temperature of the Earth. Okay? Uh, so that's very good. We can use that as kind of a broad brush to kind of like look at global scale changes, but climate is not just the average temperature. It's all these other things as well. So it's kind of seasonality, it's kind of poles, gradients, it's kind of things like precipitation, distributions, things like that. Um, so that's, that's those points again. Um, and uh, hopefully we have a little bit of a description about how the atmosphere moves some of this energy around the planet. Okay? And that's important because the effect, how effective that moving heat from the poles to the equator to the poles that determines how part of the climate system, that determines the, the pole the equator temperature gradient. If the atmosphere is kind of not transporting, is, is not circulating very quickly, doesn't, doesn't move that energy to the poles, that means we'll have colder poles. Okay? And uh, we'll, we'll see how that feeds back, because if you have colder polar regions, we might have more ice there. That more ice will be whiter than the rocks that it would have been sitting on. That makes the albedo, so the reflectivity, go up, okay? which makes the planet get colder. Okay? So those are, those are things to um, think about.